I have five main goals in this talk. Um, well, a sixth I could say is to make sure you guys stay awake because it's late. Um, I want to give you an aha moment. Many of us have simply not thought about this topic. The basic idea is not that complicated. It's very simple, but when some of you hear about this for the first time, you're gonna think like I did. Why didn't I think about this before? Aha. I want to give you something worth focusing on in both boundary maintenance and evangelism. By boundary maintenance, I mean the task of clearly deline delineating between true and false Christianity for both evangelicals and outsiders. By evangelism, I mean all the different ways that you guys are busy reaching your lost family, neighbors, friends, strangers with the truth of the gospel. Third goal is I, I want you guys to intelligently engage this issue with discernment, being equipped to identify subtleties. And four, I, want you to, I, I do want you to get a sense of just how absurd, un, unsatisfying, and blasphemous the God of Mormonism is, especially in light of its theological worldview, of the implications of that worldview. Some parts of this talk are very deeply negative, I'm warning you. Other parts are very passionately positive. So please be patient with me and bear with me. It's worth it, I think. The last goal is I want to stir up within us a passion for what really matters, the glory of God. Our greatest outrage should be that God has been dishonored. Our tears of brokenhearted boldness, God have mercy on us, should be from a grief that people do not know how awesome God is. And our driving passion should it be that people would join us in giving God all the glory for all of who he is and what he's done. The backstory. On April 7th, 1844, Joseph Smith preached his famous King Follett Discourse. In it, he taught, God was once as we are now, and as an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. It is necessary that we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so, for I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I wonder where they imagined that. Even Moroni 8.18 says that. I will refute that idea and take away and do away with the veil so that you may see these are incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. So Smith didn't think this was very deep. Here then is eternal life to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, Joseph Smith said, and to be kings and priests to God the same as all the gods have done before you. Mormon academics argue among themselves over what exactly Joseph Smith meant by this. But I'd like to focus on what theology actually developed among the Mormon people after this talk. Lorenzo Snow summarized the big idea as follows. As man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. According to Mormonism, man is in a probationary state of mortality. The test is to see if we will be worthy enough and keep all the commandments. And the goal is to be as God is. What is God? According to Mormonism, God is an exalted man. What did God accomplish? He became a God. What can we accomplish according to traditional Mormonism? We can become a God. Big G. It's important that you memorize, it's really important that you guys memorize the Lorenzo Snow couplet. And I'll give you a helpful tip that somebody taught me. With Mormonism, it always starts with man. As man is, God once was, as God is, man may be, or popularly become, the way they quote it. So, as we live out this mortal probationary experience, according to, Mormon, according to Mormonism, to whom can we look as an example of a man who succeeded in doing what we are attempting? Mormonism says, God the Father. What was God, according to Mormonism? He was as man is. 
Oftentimes we zero in on that last half of the couplet, which concerns our potential to become a god. But what I would like to focus on is the first half, as man is, God once was. While thinking about this one day, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Man is a sinner. If, as man is, God once was, was he a sinner? Before, I would talk about heavenly grandfather and the ancestry of gods and so forth. But I started asking Mormons, what do you think about heavenly father's past? Do you think he was a sinner? And the answers I received were diverse. Yes, no, maybe, I don't know, it's a mystery. Whoa, that's deep. So, like a good computer, like a good countercultist computer nerd, distracted by the internet, I went on the online forums, of course, and I started asking, was God the Father possibly a sinner? A few forum brooding internet armchair defenders of Mormonism essentially responded that I was absurd and offensive for asking such a question, that I was misrepresenting Mormonism and that Mormons do not believe that God ever sinned. Some went so, so far as to say that it's the official position of the church that God the Father never was a sinful man. It was frustrating. I, I, what I was hearing from my Mormon coworkers and friends and from strangers was very different from what I was hearing from these crafty armchair defenders of Mormonism. It irked me to be accused of simply making up the issue in the laboratory of my own mind, and it seemed like a natural extension of Mormon theology to consider that God may have sinned. So, and these guys will never live this down, they're the ones who helped drive me to do this, these, these armchair th apologists. I got a video camera and I went to the street. And I interviewed Mormons, asking what they thought. And you can see for yourself the video interview project I did at GodNeverSinned.com. The results were staggering. To help you understand the results, and please listen very carefully. I don't want you to misrepresent this issue. Please, very carefully. Let me spread out the results in a spectrum. Some Mormons definitely affirm that God was once a sinner. And some Mormons definitely deny that God was ever a sinner. But bet between those two ends, you have a range of ambiguity and uncertainty and speculation and diversity. Some say probably yes, some say probably no. Some simply say, I don't know, but that would make sense. All answers considered about two thirds, listen carefully, two thirds of the Mormons I've talked to and I have talked to a lot of Mormons about this issue over the past few years, affirm that God the Father was once, perhaps, a sinner. I, ch I choose my words very carefully here. I am not stereotyping Mormons as believing that God the Father sinned. What I'm saying in a nutshell is that roughly two-thirds of Mormons that I've talked to and here in Utah fall within the spectrum that at least says God the Father was perhaps a sinner. It, it, that ranges from, I don't know, perhaps, yes. All right, that's what I'm encompassing. About two thirds of Mormons I talk to are on that part of the spectrum. Roughly one third deny that God ever sinned, or in other words, they positively affirm that God never sinned. I want this to sink into you. I didn't make this up, all right? Please let this sink into you and ask God right now to give you a holy, righteous indignation and outrage. And ask him for tears at the same time. Ask him for brokenness in you over this, right? Because what Mormons are inclined to believe, ultimately, I mean, you have the same rotten dad, Adam, you right? Same species, same fallenness, you know better than they are, and they're lost. Give them Ask God for tears and ask God for outrage. Jesus wasn't beyond this emotional complexity. At times he was grieved and angered at the same time. All right? These are some real Mormon responses I have received to the question of whether God was once his, perhaps a sinner. Sure it's, sorry. sure, it's very possible. First response. And you can listen, hear, see most of these for yourself on GodNeverSin.com video. Sure, it's very possible, 
asking, was one God the Father possibly once a sinner? Sure, it's very possible. It says you know that with God it's one eternal round, and I think it's the same process that keeps on going and on and on and on through eternity. And so, yeah, it's very possible that he was just a normal man like us at some point on another world. I do. I think that making mistakes is an essential part of the learning process. So this Mormon says, so if you follow logic and reason, definitely I think it's a distinct possibility. It makes me more comfortable. Because I was asking Mormons, how does this make you feel that God was once perhaps a sinner? It makes me more comfortable, he says, in the sense that we have hope to overcome what he overcame and to become as great as he is. Then certainly we have the hope to overcome all our trials and sinful natures as well. He's like us, I guess. There's a lot more to it than that, than what's up front. I actually look more toward worshiping a God that we can become like. Just look at where he's at now. That's all that matters. At one point before his progression, I'd say that maybe it's possible, but, but I don't know that there's any, anything that I've ever read that's, or heard that's reliable, but I think it's a possibility. It would make sense to me, knowing that it's not unreachable, unreachable to be like that, knowing that he was once like we are now. Uh, you know, I think that's the one thing that really attracts me to Mormonism, the whole how we can become like God. And God being a sinner, that's really complicated because if there was a savior, then his sins were washed clean through that savior, and then he wouldn't have been a sinner uh, kind of like us. If we repent of our sins, then we could become clean. It's a complicated question. I, I, I really don't know enough about it, really. I'm not going to say that I would be shocked or horrified if it was the case that God ever did anything wrong. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked or horrified if, by the, if, if he ever was a sinner. It, it would have been a long time ago, and he's definitely progressed past that, obviously. And I, I don't know the steps that he would have, have to do to progress past that or exactly what happens, but it doesn't really affect my worship in any way, just because I don't know enough about it. Really, it's complicated stuff like that. I, I just don't know enough about it to let it distract me. So I just try to focus on the more simple things, more simple stuff of just trying to live better every day, because that's really just what the teachings are, just try to be better the next day than you were before. A sinner like us? I, I've heard a lot of things about that, and Lorenzo Snow did say that. I, so I'd say that God experienced many things much like the Savior did. To what extent? I, I don't know. It, that's not something our church really focuses on. We try to focus on what we're doing here in this life about Jesus Christ. We do believe that we do have the potential to become like our Heavenly Father, but I think that we're trying to focus on being good Christians, followers, disciples of Christ. Absolutely. He went through the same things we did. He knows what we're going through. And obviously, he, he obviously lived his life right because he became a God. It assures me that I always... That I, that I can always do better and become like unto God, like the scriptures tell us to. And that's absolutely an inspiration in my life, more according to the ways of, to live a, my life away to the ways according to the church. Because that's obviously where we all want to eventually get. I believe in eternal progression. I believe that everything is matter and spirit, therefore God probably was a sinner. Probably he repented of his sins and somehow he, he, got his, he made his way up there where he is right now. If he's sinned or not, that, that's not, not my concern. It kind of makes me feel closer to him in a way that I know that he felt the same things I'm feeling right now while I'm alive. He, he went through similar things that I'm going through right now and, and that eventually through practice and through perfecting myself and whatever skills I can develop, I can eventually become like him. That gives me hope for the future. I don't think it really matters. If, if, if God was a sinner, then great. It doesn't really matter. The atonement of Jesus Christ provided for us here on earth, who are all sinners, allows us to be cleansed through his blood, through his saving grace, allows us to be cleansed from all of that. So to me, it doesn't really matter or not whether or not God the Father was ever a sinner. Because if he was, if that was the case then the very existence of him as a God means he overcame those sins. And if there was a situation where he had a redeemer, as we have Christ, then he overcame it, and he was blessed by the grace of that redeemer. Consider also these responses I have received from other Mormons. Mormon apologist Craig Ray of FAIR, the Foundation for, Ap for Apologetic Information and Research, he told me on video, well, before he received his exaltation, he lived on a world, and it's possible that God sinned. But he could have been a savior on a world as Jesus is a savior on this world, and therefore he could have lived a sinless life and therefore, and therefore not have. So we don't have his records. 
we don't have information about his life, so we don't know. There's no doctrinal statement by the church about his life. Mormon apologist and Oxford graduate scholar Daniel O. McClellan writes, A correct understanding of the development of Israelite theology clearly does not preclude God having once been a sinner. The Bible leaves open the idea that God was once a man and that he may and that he was once imperfect like the rest of us. That's not uneducated lay Mormon. That's Oxford graduate Mormon apologist Mormon. I wish in our culture we had something equivalent to ripping our shirts off and crying blasphemy. I don't know what the equivalent to that is in 2011 in American culture. In 2007, I publicly asked BYU professor Robert Millett a question about the Mormon God's past. I, pr I tried to provoke the issue. I provocatively tapped into a cultural hot button issue. Hear me out, all right? I asked, this is my question to Millett, a public setting, can a practicing homosexual repent of his sins, convert to Christ, and then be fully celestially exalted unto Godhood? That's the first question, Dr. Millett. The second question is, since as you've said elsewhere, we really don't know much about the past of God the Father, should we be open to the possibility that God the Father once lived a mortal probation wherein he was once a sinner, and even perhaps a practicing homosexual, and then converted to his savior? There was a silence. It was interesting, one guy in the back of the crowd started clapping, he was like, <laughs> And, and we're like in a liberal Methodist church with like rainbow banners on it too, so it was really awkward, but. I'm not sure why he was clapping. Millet answered. The answer to your first question is absolutely of course. The LDS position on homosexuality is the same as the LDS position on immorality. In heterosexuality, our position is quite simple. It's not, as, it's not simple in some ways, but it's simple to state. Any and all sexual relationships outside the bonds of marriage are sinful and need to be repented of. Your question was, can such a person repent who has been practicing their homosexuality? Yes. Can they be forgiven? Of course. Can they go to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom? Of course they can. Can they one day become like God? Which is what I believe the scriptures talk about when they talk about pu the purifying, cleansing power of the atonement, making us joint heirs with Christ and partakers of the divine nature? The answer would be yes. So perhaps in the future generations of the gods, this is my comment, perhaps in the future generations of the gods, spirit children of some of the gods out there have a god who was once perhaps a practicing homosexual. This is my, I, I'm trying, when, when you think of sin in our culture, it's just sort of like generic and, yeah. I'm trying to really tap into like cultural hot buttons, get people to think about this, all right? So he, he goes on to answer my second question. The second question, Millet says, does my lack of knowledge about God's past cause me to go so far as to speculate that he might have been a sinner on another world? You mentioned a specific sin. I would say a sinner of any kind. I just don't know enough about that. This is one of Mormonism's best academic spokesmen, who Richard Mao says is a fellow brother in Christ. Rich Millet says, I just don't know enough about that, about whether God the Father was a sinner. All I can say is that the only God I know is the God I know now. Your question, though fascinating, all I can say is, I don't know anything about it. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Do I think that it's possible that God was a practicing homosexual in another world? No, but that's just a personal response. That's not a church response. God is God, Millet says. He possesses all the attributes of godliness and perfection, and as far as we, as, this is the subtlety you have to watch out for, as far as I know, he's been God forevermore. Really important, subtle, qualifi hidden qualifiers there that are important to tap into. I'll talk about that more later. What we, are to under what we are to understand by Joseph Smith's statement and Lorenzo Stowe's statement, and beyond that, what is, beyond what is made by other, by those two people, Millet says, I know not. 
I wish I could say more, but that's all my answer. Further probing often reveals much under the surface. I'm training you here to identify the subtleties. Mormons will literally switch their position in a matter of seconds on this issue. When I simply remind Mormons about Lorenzo's snow couplet theology, they often go from denying that God ever sinned to either affirming it as a possibility or even as a probability. Or at the very least, they affirm it as an acceptable position they are comfortable with other Mormons having. The longer I have talked to people about the specific issue, the more I have learned to probe. The harsh, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to go gangbusters and be a basher here, it's just, just a cultural observation that I can't get away from, and it's just important to be realistic about. The harsh reality is that the culture of Mormonism fosters an acceptance of equivocation and obfuscation. It's a soft leftover of the past culture of hard secrecy that Mormonism used to practice in the earlier polygamy era. Today, Mormons don't feel, fear jail, jail time. They don't fe fear jail time, but they are concerned over rejection. In some instances, Mormons see their obfuscation as a kind of benevolent deception, a, a giving of milk to me lest I choke on meat. Sometimes a Mormon will tell me they believe God never sinned, but upon further conversation, I learn that they believe God never sinned as God. In other words, that God perhaps sinned as a mortal before he became a God, but once he achieved a full state of ex exaltation and Godhood, he never sinned thereafter. So when the Mormon tells you God never sinned, you gotta, you gotta probe more, um, often. You can't stereotype anybody, you gotta, you just ask the questions. Sometimes a Mormon will tell me that they believe God never sinned, but upon further conversation I learn that they believe God never sinned in as much as we are speaking about one epoch of time relative to our particular generation of the gods, relevant to this planet alone, or relevant to some limited, lessened sense of eternity that belongs in a larger set of eternities. So as far as we can look back in time, time merely as we know it, God never sinned, and so forth. Perhaps God sinned in a prior eternity, beyond our eternity. I had a 50-minute conversation with a Mormon apologist about this, and it wasn't until like the last five minutes. He had totally given me the impression that he believed God never sinned, and then he finally let loose a little qualify, qualification that was like, whoa, last five minutes or a 50-minute conversation. Well, beyond this eternity, maybe he was a sinner. You really got to probe deeper here. Sometimes the Mormon will tell me they believe God never sinned, but upon further conversation, I learned that they believe we should simply treat God as though he never sinned. The power of the atonement would have canceled out Heavenly Father's past sins, and we should treat them accordingly, forgotten and erased. This is extended even to the idea of history. We ought to simply pretend as it goes that God never sinned, because no one ought to remember his past sins. You can remember these three obfuscations by each of the three words, God never sinned. Some say God never sinned as God. Some say God never sinned as far as our framework of time. And some say it is as though God never sinned because any atonement would have, that would have applied to, um, to his account would have canceled out his sins to literally be remembered no more. Another tricky obfuscation is sometimes accomplished through the simple denial that one believes God ever sinned. So when a Mormon tells you, I don't believe God ever sinned, it sounds like they're positively affirming that God never sinned. Um, but as with other situations, further conversation sometimes reveals that a person is simply refraining from committing to any position he or she neither confirms nor denies that God sinned. So some, someone saying they don't believe something isn't necessarily them saying they believe the opposite. Does that make sense? The fact remains that Mormonism suggests God the Father was once perhaps a sinner. And most Mormons, in my experience, seem willing to tolerate the idea as a real possibility. This begs a particularly unsettling question. It is here that I must especially ask my listeners here for patience and emotional self-control. 
Brothers, again, let your outrage be mingled with a broken heart over the lost. If Heavenly Father was once perhaps a sinner, only sins which permanently disqualify or disable a person from achieving full celestial exaltation unto Godhood are sins that he absolutely never committed. Hear me out. Put it another way. Any sin that doesn't permanently disqualify a person from achieving full celestial exaltation unto Godhood is a sin that Heavenly Father in Mormonism may have committed. The only, does it make sense yet? The only sins that traditional Mormonism says disqualify someone permanently from achieving Godhood are murder, and some Mormons even um, limit that to like post-Temple Covenant murder, and blasphemy against the Holy Ghost, and some Mormons will say second-time adultery. So Mormon theology says any other things you do in life you can repent of and become a god. And I'm just connecting the dots here. That means that if God was once perhaps a sinner, we can legitimately speculate that he has perhaps committed any sin we can conceive of except those things. Think about it. What are some sins that you find especially gross and heinous that a person, according to Mormonism, can conceivably repent over unto celestial exaltation and godhood? Those are the sins that the God of Mormonism may have committed. The God of Mormonism, by the way, this might sound sensationalistic, but to me, sensationalism is when you take something that isn't sensational by nature and you sensationalize it as more uh, shocking than it really is, maybe, in context. I don't think I'm doing that here. This is God. To me, it is inherently disturbing to think that God could have done these things. And I want people to feel disturbed by that, and I don't feel bad about trying to get people to feel bad about the idea that God was once perhaps a sinner. If you feel icky after this, then I've done my job, okay? This, the God of Mormonism may have been involved in adultery, arrogance, bestiality, blasphemy, bitterness, bribery, callousness, child abuse, coveting, cowardice, cruelty, drunkenness, false prophecy, gossip, hatred, the practice of homosexuality, idolatry, laziness, leading children astray, lovelessness, lust, lying, pedophilia, pornography, rape. I will never worship a god who was once perhaps a rapist. Resentment, spousal abuse, stealing Ponzi schemes, unfaithfulness, unjustified anger, violence, voyeurism, witchcraft, Can you imagine having a worship service right now, if you were a Mormon, singing, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God. Age to age he stands and time is in his hands. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Can you imagine singing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, after learning the list of the sins your God committed before being redeemed by the blood of another savior. You wouldn't want to worship your heavenly father. You'd want to worship the God who forgave your heavenly father. Some Mormons object that I am devaluing the power of the atonement since I am denying that the atonement can turn a sinner into a God. Mormon blogger James Stutz puts it this way. So in our view, it doesn't matter one bit that, God, that a person sinned at some point in their existence prior to becoming a God. It doesn't preclude the possibility of being divine because atonement can be made and the sin can be totally eradicated. In this, in this sense, I think we have a much more robust doctrine of atonement than mainstream Christianity. Our view of atonement is powerful enough to make gods out of sinners. Theirs isn't. It doesn't frustrate our sense of existence to speculate that God the Father was once like us. In one, in one lunch talk I had with a student at BYU in which we spoke at length on the issue of whether God sinned, I was even told that I was blaspheming the power of the atonement by insisting that God the Father never sinned. How's that for irony? The argument goes like this. If Heavenly Father was a sinner, then we ought not think it consequential because the power of the atonement would have wiped his sins away to be remembered no more. In other words, since our God treats his forgiven, atoned for people as though they never sinned, ought we 
to assume a once redeemed heavenly father not be treated as though he never sinned? There are a number of problems with this. When a Mormon tells me, when I say, God the Father never sinned, and they said, well, you're devaluing the power of the atonement, um, hear me out. This turns salvation and power of the atonement into an abstraction, a sourceless principle, an impersonal law that governs the genealogy of the gods rooted in no ultimate personal being. Think about it. If God the Father was a sinner and was redeemed, who would have saved him? Who would have atoned for his sins? The answer is another savior than Jesus Christ. In other words, salvation and the power of the atonement here are not referring to something accomplished exclusively by Jesus Christ, but rather to a principle that is implemented by a multitude of unidentified saviors across the genealogy of gods. In Heavenly Father's case, it would have been accomplished by another savior in the cosmos than Jesus, a sibling of Heavenly Father, which would be our spirit uncle. I hope you can identify the irony here with me. Mormonism has criticized the God of the Nicene Creed as a cold, abstract, impersonal principle. It's a selling point in Mormonism that God himself is an exalted human of the human species. This is what makes him personal, according to Mormonism. The irony is that Mormonism has inadvertently paid homage to a set of principles, an eternal law that governs the genealogy of the gods. God himself is God because he abides by these external laws, which eerily sound like platonic forms. But abstract principles and abstract objects have no power. They have zero causal relationships. If eternal law and eternal principles, including the principle of the power of the atonement, are ultimately co-eternal with God and independent of an ultimate God, saying that I devalue the, the the power of the atonement is like saying that I devalue the abstract mathematical principle of the number two. It's like saying you're blaspheming the cold, impersonal, abstract principles that govern the gods. The very caricature that Mormonism makes out of the Nicene Creed is a caricature that Mormonism comes to fulfill. The problem of Uncle Jesus. If we become gods and send our own firstborn sons to atone for the sins of other spirit children, salvation and the power of the atonement will refer to an implementation of principles by a yet another savior. What do you call the siblings of your father? Tell me. Aunts and uncles. What would our heavenly father relationally be to our future spirit children? What do your kids call your dad? What would our elder brother Jesus relationally be to our future spirit children? Uncle Jesus. In a family reunion of the genealogy of the gods, our heavenly father would be a heavenly grandfather, and our Jesus would be their spirit uncle. If God the Father was saved by his own elder brother, then he was saved by our spirit uncle. Abstracting the atonement across a potentially infinitely number, infinite number of saviors across the genealogy of gods turns the king of kings, the lord of lords, the god of gods, the most high Jehovah God, the alpha and the omega into uncle Jesus. That's not the Jesus I know. Amen? Something else worth addressing here is a profound misunderstanding of what it means for sins to be remembered no more. In Jeremiah 31, 34, God says, I will, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. But this does not mean that God will literally forget that we have sinned. Think about it. Does this mean that God will no longer relate to us as a God who has forgiven us for past wickedness? Does this mean that we will put out of mind the glorious fact that we were sinners who were forgiven? I submit to you that the biblical idiom, remembered no more, it, it just means that God will not hold our sins over us in a condemning matter. 
let me put to rest any notion that we will someday forget that we were sinners, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. Heaven is not a place for forgetting that we were redeemed. Heaven is a place for celebrating that we were redeemed. Amen? In Revelation 5, 9 through 14, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. They're obviously focusing on his death, by the way. And by your blood you ransomed people, uh, I'm sorry, people from every tribe and tongue and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard around the throne and the, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, myri uh, numbering myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain! to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and forever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Think through with me. Does God do that to his Savior? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 has an unexpected point of relevance here. It's really cool. A sinner saved by grace cannot properly boast in himself. Oh, how relevant Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is to this to God's very nature. For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. If God was forgiven for past sins, he would publicly thank and praise and worship and celebrate the one who forgave him. He would boast in another. But God doesn't give thanks to anyone. He boasts in himself. Therefore, God never sinned. If Heavenly Grandfather was redeemed by the blood of another lamb, then he ought to be forever singing to this uncle of ours, as it were, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and honor and wealth and wisdom and might, and glory and blessing. But he doesn't. Instead, <laughs> instead, we have a God who says things like Isaiah 40, who has measured the spirit of the Lord and or what man shows him counsel? Whom did he consult and made him understand? Who taught God the path of justice and taught him knowledge? or showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket and are counted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like a fine dust. To whom will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. In Isaiah 42, I am the Lord and that is my name. My glory I will not give to another. Sing to the Lord, God's saying, sing to the Lord. Praise me, praise me, boast in me, love me. Redeemed saviors don't talk like, I mean, redeemed people don't talk like that about themselves. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it and the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert and the cities lift up their voice. Let the inhabitants sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the nations. Let them give God glory and declare his praise in all the coastlands. Isaiah 43, 10, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 44, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know not any. Isaiah 48, for my name's sake I defer my anger, for the sake of my praise I restrain it for you, that I may, that I may not cut you off for my own sake. Comma, for my own sake, 
I do it. For how should I let my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. And don't you dare smuggle in some foreign qualification that says for us or for this planet or for this generation of the gods. Please don't do that. No. Let God's absolute statements about himself stand as absolute. The atonement doesn't turn sinners into many worshiped gods. It turns sinners into worshipers of the one true God. So, sorry, I gotta calm down. So to Mormons, I, I would say, you don't know the power of the atonement to open your eyes to the absolute supremacy of a God who loves you. Consider how Isaiah 6 puts together holy, holy, holy and atonement. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two the, he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook. And the voice of him who called in the whole house was filled with smoke. And I said, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of an unclean people, a, a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim said to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. The clearest alternative position among Mormons is that God the Father was a sinless savior for another planet. Roughly one-third of Mormons, in my experience, seem to adopt this view. I, I have a lot of thoughts about that. That's one of the big sections I cut out. Go to GodNeverSin.com. You can read about it there. Don't have time. I must address this issue of officiality and Mormonism's use of the abstract concept. Among both groups of Mormons, those who say God never sinned and those who say he was once perhaps a sinner, it is common to hear the objection, but that's not official Mormon doctrine. It says though Mormons feel like they have two categories of beliefs. One category is of doctrines Mormons feel like they have a, an obligation to publicly, publicly confess and testify to. Another category is of teachings and beliefs and ideas that Mormons feel encouraged to consider or, or even believe, but they don't feel obligated to publicly confess or defend or testify to. One example would be Heavenly Mother. It is common Mormon belief. It is a natural, logical extension of what the Mormon leadership worldview and the worldview teaches. It's something the LDS Church knows its members believe, or at least find acceptable, it's, but it's not something Mormons feel obligated to publicly testify to. You can ask a Mormon, do you believe in Heavenly Mother? And the answer will often be dictated not by what the individual personally believes, but by what the individual feels obligated to publicly own. As Helen Whitney, producer of the PBS special on Mormons, said to Mormons in, in this YouTube video, own those beliefs, don't shave off the rough edges so they fit the mainstream, otherwise the criticism will still be there, however understandable, 